We had a look last week at um, Joseph, and we saw that he was a favoured person. He was favoured by his father, he was favoured by uh, ultimately the whole of Egypt, but there was a big journey in between that took place. This morning, I want to move along, and we're going to look at, uh, I've called this morning's talk, God's Leader. Can I just have that up on the back there as well? It's a really good cheat when I've got it up in the back, so I don't have to read off my notes then. Leadership is important, and I want you to hear this loud and clear. It is both a gift and a discipline. God gives the gift of leadership, and great leaders don't stay at that place. So he often gives gifts, as we know, in seed form, but he does give the gift of leadership. Great leaders are formed over time, and with training, and with experience, and with a few knocks and bangs and things like that. One of the, um, John Wimber had a lot of really important things to say and often he didn't even realise that he was exercising the gift of wisdom. But he used to say of, of uh, leadership, we can't put into people what God hasn't. And I know that there are many thoughts out there when it comes to leadership that you can actually create a leadership, a leader, leader from nothing. In other words, any old person will do. You give me the person, I'll produce the leader for you. Um, people like John Maxwell have basically said that, and I, I enjoy a lot of Maxwell's stuff. But I've come to learn over the years that there, is, um, there are limitations to that. So here we recognize that God gives gifts, and one of the gifts is leadership. Moses is a fantastic example of God-given leadership, and then of the formation that needs to take place in order for that leader to become a great leader. So I want to look at him this morning. He's the obvious biblical example of God-given leadership. Uh, just a few details about his life that you may not know. He lived for 120 years. Things have changed. His life of 120 years was incidentally made up of three seasons, each consisting of 40 years. And we can learn something very um, poignant from each of those seasons in his life because all together they formed the leader that he became. So ultimately going through the seasons of leadership, Moses became the person he did in the end, the one who led Israel out of Egypt. He was responsible for that. He was responsible for taking them out of bondage and leading them into freedom, into the promised land of Canaan. And as we understand the seasons of leadership, it becomes easier to recognise not only that in him, but you'll start to see it in others as well. And so here at Southland, we have a thing called Southland School of Leadership. We believe in training for leaders. Um, one of our priorities is to target young people that we think God has given a gift of leadership, and you can't always tell immediately, and then give them the opportunity to put their best foot forward, begin to train, and begin to embark on the season of, on the seasons of leadership. And so we have an incredibly uh, generous opportunity for young people, whereby we provide a full scholarship for them to enter into Southland School of Leadership, to take on a course which has been developed in South Africa that ultimately will give you accreditation to then go on to do master's degrees and PhDs if you wish. In fact, we're about to sign an agreement with Tabor College here in Adelaide. The ink is wet, it's about to happen. And so that course will give young people uh, a one-year credit towards a Bachelor of Anything You Want at Tabor, basically. So that's very important on the Australian scene. Uh, this has been able to happen very quickly and all the right people have been in place. Furthermore, we can also offer those young people a full, uh, about a 90% scholarship to study through a university in the US and come out of that with a master's in missional leadership. So these are all exciting things. If you're a young person, if you're under 35 and you want to look at this, um, I'd love to talk to you because we have slots for next year. So come and talk to me about that. We believe in leadership is the long, uh, the short thing of saying what I've just said in about five minutes. I want to, this morning, have a little look at the three seasons of leadership. 
The three seasons of leadership in Moses' life can be seen basically as this. Firstly, the birth of a leader. Secondly, the death of a leader. And thirdly, the resurrection of a leader. Now, that must sound familiar to us. You see, we shouldn't be surprised that this pattern goes right through Scripture, Old Testament to New Testament. The first 40 years of Moses' life is a season that's marked by what the leader can do. And so when we recognise leadership in a young person, we're generally looking at what they're doing. And these young leaders are incredible. They're very easy to spot. Wherever they go, there's a crowd of people and they're good at organising. They're usually control freaks. Sometimes they're quiet in doing that, but they're control freaks nonetheless. And so Moses, in his early life, was marked by obvious gifting. There was no doubt this guy was a leader. He had the favour of God on him. There was a calling. And as a Hebrew, he was protected by the threat of slavery as he was in hostile territory in Egypt. He was protected by death and he was actually taken in to Pharaoh's own family. Moses was destined for greatness. It was obvious. Uh, If not to the throne of Egypt, he would have probably ended up being the governor of Egypt or a royal advisor. See, often we can recognize leadership in young people and in part it will be related to their pedigree. So in other words, if their parents are leaders, there's a great chance that they're going to be leaders. We see this in AFL footballers for a start. The succession of of fathers and sons is a, is a good example in AFL footy where you have the Gary Ablett and then you've got Gary Ablett Jr. And when he has his, it's going to be another legend of football, obviously. So o- that often happens in leadership. It happens in clusters. It happens in clusters of churches, it happens in families, it happens in all sorts of different cohorts. And so the first 40 years is marked by what the leader can do. The second 40 years is interesting because this season is marked by what the leader can't do. And often what happens in young people when they come into leadership and the not so young is that they find there's a point where their own natural or God-given talent runs out. And usually at that point they hit a crisis. Everything looks like it's falling over if it isn't and they often go through a crisis and so Moses had that thing happen to him as well. He fled into Egypt, or he fled Egypt, I should say, into the desert. And his life for that next 40 years looked very insignificant and unproductive. This seems like death, and all the potential that Moses had to lead Egypt died in the desert. This was a time that God would speak to him and deal with many of his character flaws, It was also a time that God would put structure into his life and discipline. Moses' life for this next season went through the refiner's fire. It would have been a difficult time in his life. And many of us will relate to that. Those of us that are a little bit more mature, you'll understand that there are seasons that you go through where those things happen. This is a season where often it feels unproductive and painful. But let me say this. This season is essential for the making of a great leader as opposed to a gifted leader. You see, many gifted leaders do not advance beyond the first season because they're in avoidance mode. They're trying to avoid the refiner's fire. So they never really embark on the desert experience and they never really come out of that experience a better person. Moses did all of those things. Then he entered into a third season of life, and I call this season the season that is marked by what God can do. So it starts with what you can do, it then has a season where you discover there are things you can't do, and then the third season is all about what God can do. Because it was God that brought Moses back into Egypt. He spoke to him out of the bush, and he sent him back to Egypt. Moses was a very different person at that point. He was 80 years old. And when he was young, he was a confident leader. He was probably so confident that he could change the world. And he felt that he could do that. And that's why, essentially, he killed the Egyptian. Because he believed that by his own actions, 
he could fix up what he saw as being, was, as being gross injustices. Now, many of us are still in that stage where we think we can fix every issue in life by, by what we're good at. So we set our heart towards doing that. I don't want to discourage you for that, but I want you to understand that you're probably going to hit the wall eventually and then you'll discover where God kicks in. So Moses had strength, he had power, he had charisma, he had charm, he had education, and he had all the resources of the throne of Egypt. He was born with a silver spoon in his hand, so to speak. You see, leaders that enter the third season of life out of that second season are, again, very easily recognisable because they actually walk with a limp. One of their legs have been broken. One of their arms have been broken. Something that they've lost, often family members. Jobs that have crashed and burned. Careers that have gone south drastically. And they've gone into that season and had to rediscover a whole bunch of things. Now, I believe that there's a bunch of people in this room this morning in the second season of leadership. And I want to encourage you there's a third season coming. But don't try and avoid what God's doing with you. You see, the confidence that they once had in themselves has been dented. And again, you'll probably identify with that. But if you allow God to refine yourself, then your dentedness will be replaced by a dependence on God. And that's a great thing. That's where you enter into the third season. So what is a third season leader? You might recognize the picture there. It's in London, obviously. And the guy in the foreground is Winston Churchill, one of my absolute heroes. And if you look at Winston's life, you'll see very close similarities to what happened with Moses. He went through all those three stages. World War I was a disaster to him. World War II was the ultimate victory. But it, it took a whole... And it's not that way, it's that way, right? It took a whole... Uh, process for him to get to that place and so this morning I want us to focus on the third season of leadership we're not going to talk so much about the journey this morning as we are the third season because I want you to aspire to it I want you to aspire to it so much that you're prepared to go through the th second season and so this is a leader who's graduated beyond gifting and beyond ability this is a leader who has allowed God to refine him or her and to be refined by the school of hard knocks as well. Because God is in that thing. There's nothing that happens that God isn't in. Third season leaderships are defined by who they are, not what they can do. Who they are is their identity is found in Jesus. In other words, they're not afraid to go through that second season of life. Moses came to understand that without God, his gift was not only stunted, but it was dangerous. You see, if God doesn't beat us up and let our legs get broken so that we come out of it with a limp, we often end up dangerous people. And so over the years, Deb and I have watched many young people appointed to very senior positions. And it's often a curse on the, on the person. It often stunts their growth and they, they don't get the opportunity seriously to go through that second season of life a third season leader will not go anywhere without god because they've come to the place of understanding that they there's many things they can't do so they won't go to that place without god now if you have text other than the niv and i'm going to be using that so if you've if you're happy with the niv you can look on if you have a better version god bless you open it up right now we're going to go to Exodus chapter 33. And I'm just going to read through, through to about verse 17, and then we're going to have a look at it. So it begins, Then the Lord said to Moses, Leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt, and go up to the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you and drive out all the ites. And there's a list of them there. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you on the way. When the people heard this, 
sorry, when the people heard these distressing words, they began to mourn, and no one put put on any ornaments. For the Lord said, had said to Moses, Tell the Israelites you are a stiff necked people. If I were to go with you, even for a moment, I might destroy you. That should be very, very shocking for us. Now take off your ornaments and I will decide what to do with you. So the Israelites stripped off their ornaments at Mount Horeb. Verse 7, Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to, to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrance to their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Verse 10. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshipped, each at the entrance to his tent. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide, Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send me with. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so I may know you, and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, My presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Verse 15, Then Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. I want to suggest to us this morning, guys, that this particular passage describes very well a third season leader. This is where we want to be in many respects. Again, I'm going to probably disappoint you if you Uh, want a really good exposition of the Old Testament. You you guys know I'm not great at that. But there's many things to learn from this passage. And what we can learn is that there are certain marks that are quite obvious about a third season leader. And this text is rich with those marks. In fact, I've identified seven of them. It's always a good number to have. Let's look at some of the attributes of a leader who's in the third season of their development. Firstly, we're going to see calling. We're going to see the call of God in their life. This is a really important thing. In Exodus 33, verses 1 through and 2, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Leave this place, you and the, and the people you brought up out of Egypt, and go to the land I promised on oath to Abra- Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So God called Moses, in this case, it seems like he called him, th- called him through an audible voice. He spoke to him and he said, leave this place. Now we often think of calling as come to this place. But in this instance, God spoke to Moses and said, leave this place and go where I tell you. Every leader who's been effective in building a ministry with God's favor on it has been called. There are no leaders in God's economy that have not been called. Sometimes calling can be interesting. It can come through other people. It can come through circumstances. It can come through an audible voice. I've never really had that one, but other people do. It can come prophetically and be confirmed by others. It can come through the Bible. Or it might just be a gut feel. There are are many ways that callings can happen. But the important thing about calling is that we are ultimately convinced that this is God. So people who hear a calling don't respond to the first voice they get. I don't know about you, but there's one little thing sitting on that shoulder, you know the cartoons, 
Then there's another one that sits on that shoulder. And they both speak often equally as loud. And so with calling can often be confusion. And it's really important that we test calling. We've done lots of teaching on that in the past, so I'm not going to go into that this morning. But calling is so important when it comes to leadership. The second thing we see in Moses' life is that we see authority. And so third season leaders are people who walk in authority. And it says here in Exodus 33 verse 4, when the people heard these distressing words, they began to mourn and no one put on any ornaments. Why did they do that? Because Moses spoke with authority. It says the Lord had said to Moses, tell the Israelites, you are a stiff-necked people. Now, you don't get away with language like that. If I called you a stiff-necked people this morning, you probably wouldn't show up next week, and I wouldn't blame you. So Moses had authority. God had told him what to say, and he went with the, with the script. He went with God's script. Moses was given authority by God before the people. They knew that God was with him. That was obvious. The Israelites had heard God speaking to Moses and he never had to coerce them to do anything. That's a really important key in identifying authority. You see, leaders that have to coerce you are leaders that are stressed. There is basically not much authority going on in their lives. I want to suggest that we're seeing a lot of that in the 21st century, in this day and age, amongst our political leaders. We're seeing a lot of people saying a lot of things and giving us a lot of incentives, but they're saying it without authority. And so there's all sorts of stuff going on around the place, isn't there? Now, some of those people will have authority, and I believe God will raise up leaders. And sometimes we've got to be patient because many leaders are still going through either the first or second season of a, of a leader. They haven't yet got to that place of authority. And so I think our political leaders could probably learn quite a bit by just reading this passage and meditating on it. Coercion, big sticks and incentives never compensate for poor leadership. They will never make a poor leader become a great leader ever in any circumstance. True leadership is tested by looking over your shoulder and seeing who's following you. And if people are running amok, the moment you turn your back on them, then you're probably not leading with authority. And it's good to understand that. So Moses had authority. Number three, third season leaders are people of prayer. This should go without saying, but it, it, it needs to be stated. And so verse 7, it says, Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away. What do you think he's doing in the tabernacle? That's what the tent is. It's the tabernacle. He's pitched the tent so that he can inquire of God, it says. And whenever Moses went to the tent, the people watched him. They knew that he was a person of prayer. I want to suggest again that if you're in a third season of leadership, or whatever the season is in fact, that you spend time with God in prayer. Remember what I've said, the three marks of leaders of those three seasons are, firstly, it begins with what you can do, secondly, it begins with what you can't do, and thirdly, it ends with what God can do. And so a third season leader, it's absolutely vital and absolutely a must-have that they're spending time with God in prayer and hearing what he's got to say. Now, it should also follow that we are doing that through all the seasons of life. I remember when Deb and I first started leading uh, the little church that we were running, and it started in our home, it grew into Southland Church. But we, my prayers were like pretty basic. Lord, I need a car park. As you drive into, you know, Woolies Shopping Centre, it's packed. And then you get blown away because there's a park, car park that appears. Second season of life comes along, Lord, I need a car park. And he says, so do I, get out of here. And you drive around and around with everybody else. Third season of life, park in the side street and pray for the people in the shopping centre. You see, things change drastically. Prayer is so important and it definitely marks 
a person who is in that third season of life that's become dependent on God. You don't have to be coerced in attending the prayer meeting when you're in that place. You don't have to go through uh, a devotional study, a formal study. Those things are great. I've got nothing against them. And you can live with, with them or without them. But a third season leader will be devoted to prayer and will intentionally pitch a tent outside the camp. What does that mean for us? Well, for me, it means going down to where I go on Mondays and praying. For you, it might mean something else. But it's a discipline that we undertake. Moses pitched the tent, no matter what the situation was, and he went and prayed and hang out with God and spoke to him face to face. You see, this shows, prayer shows, it demonstrates our dependency on God, not just to the people that are following us, but to God himself. Moses wasn't presumptuous in anything. Instead, he placed a structure in place that made prayer a daily discipline. It was unavoidable. The tent of meeting took effort and time to construct because remember, these people were moving around. And yet it was a discipline that helped Moses come to God regularly. And we shouldn't underestimate those disciplines. In effect, this discipline, along with the fact that the people had visible evidence of Moses' dependency on God, meant that he could communicate with God and instruct Israel with authority. And that, that is so important. Now again, don't use prayer as an effect. Don't use it as part of your theatre to convince people of how good you are. That's not what prayer is about. Prayer is about prayer. Prayer is about going to God. Now, again, take as many people as you can. Hang out on your own in the tent, but lead people in different ways to engage with God in their own way as well. Fourthly, there's a fourth sign that goes with, um, with third season leaders and that's this thing of anointing and again this is something we can't conjure up it says in Exodus 33 and verse 9 as Moses went into the tent the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance now you can't replicate that a smoke machine won't do it dimming the lights won't do it Nothing will do it. You cannot replicate it. It says, whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshipped each at the entrance of his tent. So in other words, they had pitched a tent as well. They had followed Moses. They were embarking on prayer and they were looking at him because they could see the anointing come. What do people do when they look at the anointing? They aspire to it. And so third generation or third season leaders are people who have an obvious anointing on them. When they do and say things, stuff happens. That's what the anointing means, doesn't it? The anointing is marked essentially by the presence of God. Again, remember that a third season, third season leader, their primary mark is what God can do, not what they can do. And so the anointing is marked by the presence of God. One of Jesus' titles, obviously, is the Anointed One. He was called the Anointed One. His name, Emmanuel, means God with us. The anointing is about the presence of God being with us. God-given leadership carries an anointing or a presence. And again, if you get to hang out with people that are in that season of life, what you start to realize is that you need to rub up against them a bit. Because there's something about their life. There's the presence of God that's in it. I don't think there are any shortcuts to that, by the way. We can lay hands on people and we can ask God to anoint them and bless them. But ultimately, the anointing comes because they've gone through the second season of leadership. Just as Jesus was consecrated by the Holy Spirit when he was baptized, Moses was consecrated by God at the burning bush. And similarly, it happened after their second season of leadership. The anointing comes as we respond to God's calling and seek His presence, seek to live in His presence. Anointing enables leaders to accomplish a task with God 
right there with them. So in effect, we get to go for the ride and watch what's going on when we get to that season of life. And then number five, third season leaders are also people that have a vibrant and active relationship with God. Now, any relationship has its ups and downs, doesn't it? In fact, not every interaction we have in a relationship is a happy one. Sometimes our, our relational issues can be quite negative and we can hear someone shouting or ignoring us. You know, you go through, Deb and I have been married 43 years. We've been through everything. It's been mostly good. We've had, out of 43 years, I reckon 35 years of great stuff. <laughs> I'm digging a hole. Every relationship has that kind of thing happening with it. In Exodus 33, verse 11, it says the Lord would speak to Moses face to face. That tells us he had a relationship with, with God. Because previously, if you looked in the face of God, you were going to die. Moses had a relationship with God. It says, as a man speaks with his friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide, Joshua, son of Nun, didn't leave the tent. What was Joshua doing? He was going, I want what you've got. You've seen the movie, haven't you? He said, I want what you've got. I've seen you hanging around God. I've seen the relationship you've got. I want in. This is what happens when we have a relationship with God. Leadership changes when we're dependent completely on Him. Moses had a relationship with God and third season leaders recognize that their strength comes directly from the throne of God and out of the relationship they have with Him. Through prayer and dependency on God, Moses became a friend of God. You see, this is actually God's plan for all of us. To a large degree, whether you are called and anointed as a leader, God wants to have a relationship with us. You see, all the spiritual gifts ultimately lead to that place of relationship. This is, this is God's plan for us, especially for leaders. And again, if you are a position in a position of leadership, whether it be in church or in the workplace, wherever you are, you are not going to be a safe leader, I suspect, and, unless you've got a relationship with God. Particularly as you are enlightened, you're you're, you're a God person. You're a part of the way. And so in Jesus, we can see this constantly. One of our favorite verses around here is John 5, 19. It says, he only did what he saw the Father doing. You see, Jesus had such a relationship with the Father that he responded by what he saw God doing. That's relationship. And again, we can see a, a little microcosm of that in Moses and Joshua. And so that thing is replicated. As you have a relationship with God as a leader, so others have relationships with you and you become someone that points them to God. You don't become God himself, obviously, but you become someone that points them towards God. And then number six, and we're nearly done, is that third season leaders have favor with God. We looked at this with Joshua. Exodus 33, 17, it says, The Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked. Now again, you can read the text and it looks like God changes his mind. But in fact, what's taking place here is that the favor of Moses is extended to God. And God says to him, The very thing you've asked, even though I decided that I wasn't going to be present with Israel, otherwise I might kill them, I'm actually going to do what you ask because you asked me. That's what favor does, isn't it? When you've got favor with God, I'm not sure that you can twist his arm beyond his own will. I don't think that holds too much water, depending on which church you go to. But I do believe that God wants to have relationship to the point where he will defer to you because he can see your heart because he's given you favor. And so he was, ultimately he says, I will do the very thing you've asked. Now in that process, obviously, the leader has been through the first two seasons. And so God has you know, been mashing and meshing and refining and putting you in the fire and taking you out and then putting you in again. And so pretty much everything you ask at this third season of 
of leadership is probably God's will anyway. That's the way I view this thing. And so we ask at that point, as the New Testament says, according to God's will, because we've been through the mill. But that's the favour of God. Not only did Moses have friendship with God, but he also found God's favour. That's how friendships work. You see, if it wasn't true, then we'd have a whole bunch of acquaintances and no friends. But Moses wasn't just an acquaintance of God, he was a friend. And so Moses had influence with God, and God had a measure of confidence or even faith in Moses. You see, God had faith in his own work to form Moses into the person he'd become. And that is such a great thing. It's great to hang around people like this. Although Moses was totally dependent on God, he would have, I believe, and he did exude confidence to the Israelites. They were confident because they knew he'd been with God. He spoke with authority, he had favour, there was an anointing on him, all those things were working. And this air of confidence is common in third season leaders. They've got nothing left to prove. They've done it, they've hit the wall, they've failed, they've been on the journey. And ultimately, when they arrive in this third season, it's like, I can't do anything. That's their attitude often. We can only do this if God's in it, is usually their attitude. I want to, again, suggest they're the easiest people in the world to follow, people like that. Again, John Wimber, you probably worked out he's one of my heroes as a human being, um, he was an amazing guy. He made lots of mistakes. He was very public about his mistakes. Whenever he got things wrong, he'd stand in front of people, often with tears running down, and he'd say, we got that totally wrong, guys. I got it wrong. I've led you in the wrong direction. We're going that way now. And so following John Wimber was an interesting journey because we, we went through many seasons in the church. For those that have been around in the vineyard for a while, You'll remember some of those seasons. There was a big prophetic outpouring that took place in the vineyard in the 90s. People like Mike Bickle came in and were mentored by Wimber. And uh, wherever you went to a, a Wimber meeting, there would be high-profile prophets on stage giving very accurate pictures, dates, names, the whole thing. Or we've seen that here with Gary as well. It's something that's begun to happen here. But you see... What Wimber then identified well into that journey was that the prophetic gifts had been taken out of the church and put on the platform. Hello? Very easy to do, isn't it? Now, we could err towards doing that as well. And so John recognised that, and all of a sudden, the journey changed. And it came back to bringing people in, bringing ordinary people in, letting them make mistakes again and doing the whole journey all over again. So important, guys. Because that's the sort of leader, a third season leader, that will take that kind of thing on. Admit they've got it wrong and go down a road that is a road of correction. And so Wimber was frustrating and yet easy to follow because he was that kind of leader. God has a measure of confidence, I believe, in people like that. Third season leaders are confident mostly in their relationship with God, more so than the outcomes. Although Moses was totally dependent on God, he carried all that confidence and the Israel, Israelites would, were able to follow him. And then finally, we're looking at this one and I had to, I apologise, I had to break the rules of expository preaching and go to another text because I couldn't actually find it specifically in the passage we're in, so I confess my sin. Otherwise, we would have had six points and six the devil's number and we had to have a God number, right? So I had to go outside the script. And the number seven is, and it's obvious, and I think it is in the text, but we would have had to read the whole passage again. The best verse I could find for this, and I'm proof texting, was Numbers 12 and verse 3. And then I got to thinking afterwards, who wrote Numbers again? That's right, it was Moses. <laughs> and so he says this about himself. Now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. You get the twist, don't you? But I think it's pretty obvious through the life of Moses that he probably had the authority to say that. And so leadership is more than anointing. 
And it's more than the ability to motivate people to go in a direction that you want to take them. Humility is marked by a high degree of meekness or modesty. In other words, it's not pride, prideful or arrogant. Arrogant leaders, again, are very dangerous. They tend to be inflexible. Humility recognizes someone else's greatness and stands in awe of it. When you look at the life of Moses, and again, we could have used that whole passage because that's what it's all about. Moses stood in awe of the God that he served. Now, he never got to enter the promised land because of a few little misdemeanors. But the bottom line is, Moses was a man who was humble. His words definitely affirm his ministry. Humility recognizes God's greatness in our case. And I want to again suggest that all great Christian leaders throughout history stood in awe of Jesus. They stood in awe of Jesus and gave him all the glory. You know, if you read God's generals, if you read some of the books of, of great Christians throughout the ages, this thing of humility is a common link. For every single one of them, Jesus is their champion. He's their hero. He's the one they adore. They don't look at their own accomplishments. This they do genuinely and without pretense, without theatre and without effect. You see, those things people look through after a while, you can get away with it for a while. I've, I've seen leaders, usually in the first season of leadership, who get away with a lot through appearance and theatre, by having the right haircut, by wearing the right jeans, obviously I didn't get the memo, and by going through certain actions that you think people want to see. You, people like you and I, I don't know, we can see through that stuff, can't we? I can, I, I've got a sniffer for it. As soon as I get a whiff of that stuff, I want to just run out the door. So people in the third season of leadership are marked by a genuine humility and deference to God. They do it genuinely. They do it out without pretense. They do it without effect or theatre. And I want to say again, genuine humility is hard to find. There's not too many people that have it. It comes from people who are capable but people who are also safe in knowing that God has got it for them. He's got their thing. He's doing it. And they're deferring to him. And so they are safe people. Moses is a great example of the formation of a leader. And I believe that as this church matures, and we're still a young church, that we're going to be confronted by people coming into now their third season of leadership. As I look around the, round, uh, the room, many of you, pe you guys are, my, are friends, close friends. And what I see in your lives is a person often in the second season of leadership. You know, the bad news about that is that it's tough. The good news is you're coming into the third season of leadership where you won't give a hang about anything. Because you'll know that God's got it. You'll know that you know, that you know, and all those things are being formed in many of us. Many of us are coming now to a point where we're starting to see those seven marks of third season leadership emerge here in this place. Deb and I are really excited, as I said last week, to have Gary and Sarah coming on board on staff. I see in these guys leaders that are coming into their third season of leadership. I see it in many of you guys. I see it in our board. I see it in lots of people with grey hair. My hair was greyer at the prayer meeting yesterday, if you've noticed. It's a bit darker this morning. I lost a bit of wisdom overnight. But I can see in many of you guys that you're emerging out of that second season of leadership and it's really, really exciting. The other thing I want to comment on is that we have a lot of people now coming into the first season of leadership and we want more of them. We want them to come in with all their brashness with all their boldness, with all their confidence, with all their raw talent. We want them to make a mess. We want them to fail. We want to give them permission to go into the desert. And we want to do that walk with them. What we're not going to do is appoint them to, to the board as elders. That's not good for them and it's not good for you. 
What we do want to do is we want to see what they can do. Because that's what first season leadership's all about. What can you do? Show me the goods. Sign up for Southland School of Leadership. We give you permission to fail. We give you permission to discover God in the, in the desert. Because we know that the third season might even arrive before the third physical season of your life. See, again, I've seen this thing work out where people enter that third season of leadership prematurely and their effective leadership is extended. I've seen people come into it at 40 or even a wee bit earlier. You don't want to rush them into it, but they go through this horrible plunge into the desert. It's almost like they hit the depths of the ocean and they go that deep that they bob out and they hit, they breach through the surface and all of a sudden they're catapulted into leadership. I believe God's going to do that in this season as well. So let's stand together. I really want to pray and activate some people in leadership this morning.